everyone. Welcome back to the Craft and Business of Books with me, Tatiana Denford. And I'm Marissa Hussey. This is the show that discusses not only the tools, the tricks, and the stumbling blocks to the writing process, but we also offer you the kind of rarely seen behind the scenes um, perspective from not only the industry side, but also from the author's perspective as well, and everything in between. Uh, we're going to try and cover everything so that basically we give you guys the information to make the book world seem a lot less scary and get your book on the shelf. Remember that we are on every Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern, so please click the link below to subscribe and feel free to leave comments and we will address them in other episodes. Right, today's topic. So today we're talking about memoir. So the honesty and the raw process of putting a part of your life on paper and sharing it with the world. Um, it's terrifying enough when it's people you've made up putting it out there. So yeah. when it's actually you, you know, how, how is that different? Yeah, I mean, I think what's really compelling and almost fragile about memoir is it's, it's such a pure thing. It comes from such a raw and honest place. And I think I can't imagine how that feels when you're trying to get somebody to sell it. I'm, I'm wondering if that's a bit conflicting or if it's really empowering. I mean, you are offering a part of your life to someone and they have to handle it. I mean, it's, you know, your words, your experience. I think writing a book is personal enough as it is. And it's a really big thing to tackle. So when it comes to memoir, I think that I wonder if that adds a whole nother level, mm -hmm. you know, of, um, you know, of, I mean, I, I'm wondering if that's a, a little bit frustrating to kind of, you know, see it out there and, and, you know, makes it a bit more, um, I don't know, conflicting, is that the word? But, but then it must be really exciting as well because you're you're sharing something with the world that you're hoping that will connect to other people, right? I mean. Sure, it's absolutely two-sided. I think the, you use the absolute perfect word is that it is fragile. Um, and it's something to be handled quite delicately on both sides, um, or it can, it can be. Um, and it certainly, it, for, you know, I think it depends on the kind of person you are, of course. And again, on both sides of the author and, and on the, you know, the industry side working on it. Yeah. But certainly for me, it's always, it's always been a bit, a bit difficult. And I say that in a, in a, in a good way. I don't mean, um, I don't mean it negatively. It's just something that feels very different from a lot of the other work you do. Because it's one thing to have, one thing to have meetings about, you know, marketing and publicity when you're talking about fictional characters. Yeah. Even factual nonfiction, like science and history. But when it's, the author's life on the table, literally, <laughs> you know, and they are laying themselves bare to a room full of people, you know, that it feels very different for everyone, I think, you know, as long as, as, as you have a heart, of course. Um, as, we, as we are discussing, people in publishing do have them, you know. Um, but it's literally, like, it's literally an open book. Yes. Yeah. You know, it's not, I, you know, so the people that work on it, I wonder if if they kind of handle it in a very different way, or you need to kind of have a really specific team of people that see memoir in a very different way. Yeah, I think, um, you know, you need to have that on the on the support side of it. You need to have the understanding that the just because the author has just made the decision to share this. It does, that does not inherently, you know, ensure that everything that comes after that is going to feel good and comfortable to them <laughs> about those, you know, getting their story out there. You know, there is still a commercialization and monetization happening of their lived experience. And you have to be able to handle that delicately. Um, I, you know, I think you, you come to care deeply, right, for many of the authors you work with. Um, I say many because everyone's not perfect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> many of the authors you work with, you know, you work with them for such a long period of time that you, you know, you, you develop deep relationships with them and memoir as a very specific frame to your job as part, you know, as part of a publisher. I've had memoir authors ask for help with things that were very much not a part of my job remit more than any, more than anyone else. The trust there, isn't there? It's trust. It's like I'm being comfortable. Yeah. Of course, and also that they don't think they don't often think of themselves as authors, um, you know, or they don't, or certainly they didn't, uh, you know. And this kind of this story came, you know, in a lot of times. Of course, people are writing memoirs; 
things that happened to them they didn't want, they wouldn't have wanted to happen to them. Yeah. Um, you know, and certainly before it happened, they didn't think, oh, I'm going to write a book about this. Yeah. And, you know, and they'll have things about their personal lives online, you know, they, they ask for help with, um, and they've always helped them. I've always, you know, I've never said, no, I'm sorry, that's not my job. You know, I can't, I can't do that for you. But it is really interesting that I think that happens with authors who write memoir far more often than in any other any other space. Yeah, completely. So today we are going to have someone talk about what I'm <laughs> talking about that, you know, who has experienced it firsthand, uh, you know, not once but twice. Um, so our guest today is an author and broadcaster and journalist who regularly contributes to the Daily Mail, Sunday Times, Daily Telegraph, The Guardian, Harper's Bazaar, L. I'm going to use my mumbling um, to raise <laughs> Uh, she lists all of all of the publications that she contributes to, um, and she has two memoirs in print, um, as well as other books. But we're focused on the two memoirs today. So her first, uh, "The Wild Other," was shortlisted for the Wainwright Prize. Her second, "My Wild and Sleepless Nights," has over eighty-eight percent five-star ratings on Amazon, which I think it does, that's pretty impressive. Um, <laughs> yeah. Really, really yeah. To this book, um, and it was called quite simply the best book about motherhood I have ever read. In the I mean, she. I'm super excited because um, Clover is everywhere, and the and the, her energy is so genuine and generous, and she's all, always opening doors, like opening the doors to her life and to have conversations with people. Um, she, I I just feel like for me, her voice echoes a lot of voices when it comes to women and mothers and um you know i think she touches on things that we think about at some point or another and and i'm hugely excited because she is always talking to people she is always inviting them you know and kind of learning from their stories but now she's here i want to learn from her story so <laughs> so let's bring her up yep. <laughs> It's very that, nice um, sitting here and hearing all of that. I have to say, does that make you, unco does that make you uncomfortable? <laughs> you know, it actually made me feel quite emotional, almost quite tearful. Hearing <laughs> it, um, it was no, it was really, it was well, it was really interesting hearing you talking about memoir as well. I'm completely fascinated by memoir, and I love it. And um, but it's you know, it's it's strange hearing yourself written about, uh, yeah. talked about, obviously because. I spend so much time on my own and I, and I like a lot of women, because I don't think this applies to men so much, still struggle with the idea of calling myself a writer, even though I've been making my living as a writer since I was 24 and I'm now um, 45. So that's 21 <laughs> years. It's quite a long time. And, um, you know, I've done lots of journalism, but, and then the books as well more recently, but that whole idea of being, a writer is a difficult, I mean, it's an incredible thing to take on, but it's also, you know, it's, it's oddly kind of, um, I don't feel, I often don't really feel sort of worthy of it, I suppose. We have ideas about what a writer is, you know, and, um, yeah. and so, yeah, so, so that was very nice. Thank you very oh, much. I, I, I love the fact that, you know, I was saying earlier <clears throat> that you always, Kind of invite people and interview them so i'm actually i'm really excited that you're on the other side and we get to we get to yeah. hear a little bit more about you no it's, it's nice because i started do i mean i'm a journalist before i wrote books i was a journalist i've done loads and loads of interviewing as a journalist and then when lockdown happened i started doing instagram live interviews as a response to the fact that you know all so many people with books launching they all their events were being cancelled literary events being cancelled and it was it was great. I mean, I think lockdown has been an incredibly exciting and interesting time creatively, and you know the technology that's allowed me uh, me to kind of start doing interviews from my bedroom, which is where I'm sitting right now, and do it and not feel, you know, oh, have I got the right editing suite? Have I got the right graphics? Do I really know what I'm doing? I've been thinking of doing a podcast for a while, and I'd thought I'd I don't have I don't have any graphics. How can I, you know, set up a podcast? And actually realizing it's you know, it's the words and the, the stuff that we talk yeah. about is what interests people has been it's been wonderful. It's been incredibly liberating, I think. Yeah. I think, you know, and the pressure's off. And I think for people who are creating, I think to to 
not have that sitting on their shoulders that they have to present a certain way or yeah. that they can kind of be a little bit, they can think outside of the box or they're, you know, people are more generous and forgiving. Mm. When it comes to, even like, you know, people doing Zoom meetings when all that started, you know, everybody was dressing up and then suddenly everything kind of relaxed and be like, well, if this is the future, let's just kind of be a bit more accepting of children walking in or, yeah. you know, so yeah. yeah. So to, to that end, like creatively, while kind of lockdown is happening, what are you working on now whilst you're stuck at home? <laughs> yeah, so um, my second book launched in February. So it was just before lockdown happened. And um, and then, and I had been working on various different ideas and I find myself writing about my life. I have always, I didn't mean to, I didn't set out to do this, but as a journalist, I, some of the first pieces of work that I was commissioned were about things that I was doing. I, I had just got back from um, Texas in my, in, I was about 23 and I'd been working on a ranch and writing in rodeos and somebody said, oh, you should, you know, you should write an article about it. And I got this big piece commissioned in, it was actually in Tatler magazine. And from then I started I, st I often wrote about what I was doing. I had children very soon after that. Um, so in my mid twenties, I had like two kids, and and I was writing about other things as well. But um, and I was doing book reviews, and I was learning how to write, and I was writing for a lot of trade magazines, which was great for like learning how to kind of churn stuff out. But it just happened that I was kind of continually being asked to write about my own experiences, and I became more and more bold, I suppose, in my ability to express what I was going through and my kind of honest, you know, like how how far I could go into what was actually happening and, and my honesty, I suppose. Yeah. So so with my my memoirs, I've, you know, I've I've written about my own experiences and the and with the third book, I I had an idea about something else in the autumn after I'd finished the previous book, which is, you know, about motherhood, my wild and sleepless nights really, really about being a woman and the different choices we make. Yeah. But then in December, my sister died. She um, had had cancer for four years, but she wasn't, and she had been very ill, but she wasn't expected to die. She had a, a good prognosis, even though she had really bad cancer. But, um, and she died very, very quickly. And that was, you know, that was like a profound, in the space of two days, my life completely changing in a way that I felt was completely inconceivable and unendurable and you know just the most horrendous thing that I could could possibly could possibly have imagined and then I I, I wasn't really I mean I was in such a state that I wasn't really sure what I was writing about at that point yeah. but then in the beginning of this year I started processing what I was going through and I um, started Thinking. And I think lockdown was a good time, although it was quite difficult to write and there was lots of distractions, yeah. a kind of stillness and a lack of distraction from the rushing around. And I started thinking deeply about grief and about, but more about death and what death does to our lives. And for a while I felt as though, I felt like my life was over. I felt my children are going to be happy and my family will be happy, but I'm going to have to be kind of acting for the rest of my yeah. life. I just yeah. couldn't imagine ever being happy again. I couldn't. I felt like I was locked into a kind of dark cage and I was walking around with this cage on me wherever I went and going about life. I looked normal, but it was there. I just couldn't imagine it not being there. And then I sort of started seeing, you know, bits of light and bits of not a way out of this, but like the illumination that you find within it, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I became really, really interested in when people were talking about with lockdown, like, when are we going to get back to normal? And what is, you know, how can we get back to normal as though you ever can, you know, you can't go back mm -hmm. backwards in your life and, and where, you know, you wouldn't want to. And so I was thinking about kind of personal evolution and I realized I couldn't go back to the time when my sister was alive, although I would have done absolutely anything for that, anything, anything had to go forward. So I started working with that. I put the other other idea that I had aside, and I am now. I've just um, I've just started working on a third book. I've just sold that to um, you know based on my proposal, 
And um, it's about death and it's about how death can transform your life, the transformative power of death and how you can kind of endure and not just endure, but live with and potentially thrive when something, you know, when the unendurable, unimaginable happens and what that kind of the darkness does to your life, I suppose, and the light and the colour that it can bring in. Wow. So, that's where I am right now. <laughs> well, that's amazing. I mean, to, to be able to, I mean, I, I think that's something that we'll cover maybe later is to, to kind of sell and market a book and kind of make it compelling during something like lockdown from the industry side. That would, it would be really interesting to kind of find out. Um, I think what's fascinating to me also is that when you have a seed of an idea, does that change the more books you write or do you have the aha moment, does the aha moment, you call it, does it hit you in a similar way with each book? Because I write so, so personally, so autobiographically, I suppose, and because I, I live, I, I know that I have a very, um, like deep emotional response to things. I cry very easily. I get very excited very easily. I get, I go through massive periods of depression. I'm not bipolar, but I know that I have like ups and downs, and I really you know, I ride them and I feel them and I and I don't shy away from them, I go into them. So when I'm kind of writing, I'm continually going into those moments at the same time that I'm actually living them, I suppose. And I, it's really interesting, the idea of when the idea becomes alive. Yeah. And I yeah. don't know when exactly it happens. It's, I think it's a, I think I think the time that you spend thinking as a writer or any person as a writer whoever you know non writer that 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 time that you spend thinking about stuff is really 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 critically important and in the um in the autumn of last year the I'd finished the previous book in about June or July and I spent about 4 months I was doing like some of the promotional stuff and some journalism but I was also thinking a lot I was thinking a lot and I was reading a lot and I went on a writer's retreat um, run by Rebecca Schiller, which is brilliant in England. And I um, and I thought, I didn't do that much writing, but I did a hell of a lot of thinking, basically. <laughs> and I think that, um, and I didn't know at all, that this idea that I have now, I didn't, this, this, you know, didn't, I didn't know that I was gonna be writing about this at all. Yeah. So I don't know, there isn't a single like moment when it when it comes to me. And also with my first book, the wild other that's that sort of based around trauma and what trauma does to you it's, my mum had a horrendous accident when I was 16 yeah. left her massively brain damaged and I sort of um responded to that by going out on quite big adventures and being married twice and having lots of children and taking lots of risks and I knew that I wanted to write about that in, so, in some way or another I had no idea how to how to structure it you know how to turn it into a into a into a book and um it was only when we moved house to where we live now and there was something in the landscape that made me think okay this this could kind of i could structure it around this it's actually like a four and a half thousand year old chalk horse that's on the hill near where i live so i think it's for me it's like it's a very very organic process of thinking and reading and talking and feeling and writing definitely yeah, but it's and, not like a single moment. Yeah, and I, you know, it's interesting that you're living it, and that's how it comes out. Mm. You know, I think other authors, it's really interesting the way their moments come about is very similar to the voices in their stories. Yeah, other authors, like there was a, a crime author that we interviewed who said that she it came from experience because she was a barrister. Or there's mm -hmm. another that writes kind of a more romantic novels that, you know, who, you know, she sees somebody on the street and she kind of imagines kind of a movie scenario and that's how she writes. So it's really interesting that the way you get inspired is by living it. You have to just completely soak yourself in this in order for yeah. it to come out. 
Yeah, definitely. And in fact, when I was lying in bed last night, I suddenly switched the light on and made a note on my phone, which I'm always doing. Because I think that's one of the most important things as a writer is to like, when you have an idea, write it down, whether it's on the back of a cereal packet or on your phone or whatever, but just write it down because you will not remember it. You think you'll remember it, but you will not remember it. But I just text it and I just send myself literally text messages because that's the quickest thing for me to go on to. <laughs> I texted myself saying, when you lived, I uh, said so when I was 19, I lived in Ireland for about two years and I was, it was just after mum's accident and I was all over the place. And I've got this text on my phone which says, when you lived in Ireland, you didn't understand what was going on because you weren't writing about it. I don't know why I chose Ireland particularly, but I realise now so much and I feel incredibly privileged to, you know, to be able to make a some kind of living from this, that to be able to write about my experiences in order to understand them feels kind of a key to my existence you know I don't think I wouldn't say it makes me particularly happy it can be incredibly painful yeah. incredibly difficult to do but it does it does help me to understand it all and um so it is yeah for me it absolutely is about being being right in it and one of the things that's been interesting about working on this new idea and also with the motherhood idea was that I was writing my the my wild and sleepless nights when I just had my fifth baby and so I was writing in this kind of maelstrom of wow. newborn baby you know all the challenges and then a toddler and then my adolescent was being expelled at that time and so I was, I was writing it in um like real time you know as it was happening and I know that my writing like has a real power when it has that kind of the energy of of not being of not too much time having passed because I think it's easy with memoir or it's something that you can fall into is that if you look back on a period of time and you you yeah. change it and you and and when you look back on motherhood certainly it's very easy to romanticize it and just remember the like sweet chubby baby but you forget the kind of horror of it as well <laughs> <laughs> i'm 39 weeks pregnant <laughs> oh really <laughs> <laughs> oh wow congratulations she has, all the, she has all the terror to look forward to yes <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thing about motherhood it's like the complete and that's what I tried to convey in the last book was like the complete darkness and the complete light you know it takes you in the course of a single day in a single moment into real ups and downs and that was what I was really yeah. really trying to trying to write about I think I think what's interesting is that you're when you're right when you look back you tend to be a bit revisionist mm. memories because it creates less trauma depending mm. on the subject, depending on the moments. But I think writing in real time is quite brave because you are kind of peeling away layers of yourself that you may not be prepared to deal with at the time. Mm. And yet you are making your, not, not that you're forcing yourself to do it, but it comes out and you're confronting it. So mm. I just wonder if that's, you know, is that a, a form of therapy almost? I don't know, you know? Yeah, I think, I think it's really interesting, the question as to like whether it's, you know, people often say, is it cathartic? You know, the, there's the assumption that writing is cathartic and it certainly brings a lot of stuff up and you go, you know, I, when I write, I, um, if I'm writing a big kind of emotional scene or describing how I felt at a certain moment, I can think myself into that moment. I am absolutely there in it. And I'm sure that I've got better at that through practice. Like I've got better at kind of working the muscle memory and knowing how to kind of inhabit that. But obviously, and I'm writing about a lot of challenging, difficult stuff, because that's where the kind of, you know, that's where the kernel is often, isn't it? That's where the gems are basically in that darkness. And of course, going back into it is like, acutely acutely painful i was at my kitchen table earlier reading something about in this new proposal to try and work out how i'm going to do a certain bit of it and i was just sitting there with like tears you know really crying because i was right right back there so yeah. i think it's i think it is kind of you know what i said earlier about like writing about my life in order to understand it I think it, it as an art, it helps me to understand things. But I think actually writing about the experience is painful, and I think it 
is sometimes psychologically, I'm not I'm not going to say it's psychologically damaging, but it like, yeah. it's grueling. It's really grueling. And I think that that's why people find it rewarding because it kind of reminds them of what they might have been through in grief or loss or trauma or motherhood yeah. Yeah. or childbirth, you know, and it's, it's reminding us that we're not alone as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as, as your career progresses, progresses. Um, do you, do you find the process changes with how you kind of set aside time to write? So obviously memoir is a very specific genre. And I think you, like you were saying, you kind of live it and you write in real time a lot of times, but you have a full house, you have horses and children and your life is really busy. Do, has ha, Have you gotten better at carving out time to sit and write or is it always a little bit kind of last minute? Hazard, yeah. Um, well, I started writing when Jimmy, who is my son, my eldest child, who's about to be 20, when he was he was a newborn baby, and I started doing journalism then. So, and I didn't have any money for any kind of childcare and had a very chaotic life. And so I kind of trained myself from, from the start of my career, I guess, to like write in really, really challenging circumstances in short periods of time, in 20 minutes, literally here or there, tiny moments snatched when he was asleep. And then his sister came along when she was, you know, it was difficult, difficult time, difficult way to write in. And now I, yeah, the house is, you know, the house is really, really full. There's seven of us living here all the time at the moment. And, um, <laughs> But I do have I do have help with the children. I don't I've never had like a proper nanny. You know, I've never had but I've I've had au pairs. I've had somebody's child who's dropped out of uni and is a bit lost and comes to stay with us for a few months. I've had another mum in the next door village. I'll pay them to like pick the kids up from school a few days of after you know during the week so that I can do stuff at the moment um when lockdown started my teenage children actually were I paid them to look after the younger ones so that I had like I mean if I've got I can get a lot if I put Instagram away I can get a lot in like you know three or four hours I can get a lot done I can get a lot done in that period of time wow. and also when I'm immersed in a project I am thinking about it really quite intensely quite quite a lot of the time and that thinking time like I said is I think is really really that's really critically important but I think as a as a parent and unfortunately this is largely as a mothers have to do this that saying like I've got some help with the you know I'm not writing at the kitchen table with the children creating chaos around me I can't do that yeah. But I can maybe like bang out a quick 200 words for an article if somebody's asked me for that, but not the kind of deep yeah. thinking writing. I can't do that with the children around. I have to pay for help in order to do that. Yeah. And I think that, um, you know, often people feel kind of bad saying that, sort of, you know, feeling like somehow we should be able to fit it in, oh, right. you, know, you know, into the rest of domestic life. and. And and writing requires real silence and concentration. Yeah. But I, so, think, I, I think I think women make each other feel bad about that. And not in a directly kind of judgmental way, but we are expected to fit it all in. Whereas if the roles were reversed, I think men would have no problem saying, I'm just gonna throw money at the problem. Yeah. <laughs> no, definitely, definitely. And it, I mean that's well i think that is something that a lot of of us and i think lockdown has really brought that into into relief as well really struggle with yeah i mean I, you know and I, I think you know what's amazing is that we are kind of blessed that you you know have you have do carve out the time to create these deeply confessional books because i think i just I, I wonder what the books would be like if you did have to write at the kitchen table i think <laughs> i think you're right they I mean, you know there's only so much you can do and i think you know you go so deep it's like my husband says that if i'm in my writing zone i literally shut myself away in like a cave mentally mm. i cannot mm. engage with the rest of the family it's just impossible mm. especially mm. i'm sure with memoir it, it, you have to have that kind of separation you know yeah. it's, kind of dive deep yeah so you're saying that you can't write while someone needs to tell you about every single itch they have on their back <laughs> no, no <way. laughs> yeah 
Please, yeah. Please wipe my bum. Not now. Yeah. Make me something to eat. I'm hungry. That's the con. I'm hungry. Constant. Constant. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we'll transition now into a little bit more about the industry aspect of the publishing aspect of, mm. of the work, right? It's it has always felt to me per personally, right, being um, being on the side of a publisher a bit of a bugaboo to balance the respect that you need to, you need to have for an author who has just put, you know, incredibly intimate details of their lives, you know, out, out there for, you know, for, for many different reasons. Right. While being tasked with making sure that the book gets into as many hands as possible. Right. And, and that you make, you, you know, you, everyone is making money from the book. You can tell, even by the way that I present this question, Yes, yes. <laughs> it's, just, it's a struggle to talk about. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a very different thing when you're just talking to someone who has created these fictional characters, and you're, you know, it's it just it all feels a bit lighter. Yeah. Um, you know, so I'm curious about how you feel uh, when you begin to get into those conversations with your publishers about selling your story. Yeah, I mean, do you mean in terms of like? how the publicity happens after you've written the book or the um, or the advance like what you might get from the actual amount of money you might sell a book for I, I, both of those things are interesting my question was about um about marketing you know advertising yeah. and, and publicity what, what shows you might be going on what you're willing you know, what you're willing to do the, those kinds of conversations but i mean but certainly also financially that's that's mm. something i mean in terms of the publicity i think I feel lucky that I'd done a lot of journalism and I knew I had loads of really really good contacts with editors and other journalists and I knew you know how to write a book review how to write an article how to place an article you know what the different sections were who the different editors were I definitely knew how to kind of help a book to be pushed along because I've pushed lots of other people's books along and whether that's like you know, whether it's interviewing an author or putting together a trend piece or putting something in a diary, you know, there's so many different ways. And I think that for people watching this who are kind of wanting to understand that, I think like looking at the media and looking at what's going online, obviously, because unfortunately there's less and less media now, but like seeing how books, how writers crop up in different ways and understanding it and kind of like, studying it a little bit is really you know will help yeah. enormously because i think i did have an advantage because of having you know having done 20 years of journalism right. basically right. and then i mean but the great thing is it's because of the online world that you don't have to have been a journalist anybody with the amount of, i mean it's a lot of work sure with, but with the legwork anybody can be promoting themselves on multiple different channels and that is I like that way that kind of social media, I suppose, is potentially disrupting. You know, it's kind of disruptive mm -hmm. that anybody really could can get their foot in the door. It's not about contacts. It's not about, of course, there is obviously always an element of contacts help, but you can do it from, you can do it from your bedroom. You can do it from absolutely anywhere. And the amount of like, you know, massive stars on Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, whatever, proves that it can be anybody at all. Um, and I think that's that's a really, really great thing. Because I was writing so honestly and so openly, and because I always have as a journalist, I had no problem at all about, like, I can write about, I will write about anything. I like sharing my story. I'm really, really fascinated by other people. I would love to be interviewing you both and asking you really, really intimate questions because I'm so interested by, you know, how our lives end up as they are. What has made us a success? What what we found difficult? When has been the dark bits? What's your trauma? Do you have trauma? How have you got to a point in your life without having trauma? That kind of thing is like really fascinates me. So I was really happy to kind of share as much as I was asked to share, basically. Mm -hmm. And I never, because, because you know, I've written, especially, I've written really, really openly in both of my books mm -hmm. about trauma and about tragedy and about life experiences. I've written very, very openly about my sex life with my husband, for example, or my desire for somebody else or my, uh, you know, childhood fantasies. So, and in a way, by putting it all out there, 
I don't think, I mean, somebody could criticize me for it, but I'm not, I'm not keeping any secrets. You know, I'm not saying there's some part of me that you can uncover that, that I haven't already put out there. And I think that kind of honesty is kind of really liberating actually, mm -hmm. because it's saying this is, this is all of who I am and um, I'm not kind of afraid of it and I'm not hiding anything. I'm not putting any kind of spin on it. This is who I am. So um, I think from a publicity point of view, that's, that's to be unafraid of it. I definitely was really, really, really unafraid of it. Um, I, you know what's interesting is that 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 amount of um, honesty. I wonder if that's. I mean, that's probably quite empowering, not only for you to have control of how you share your life. But also I wonder if that then bleeds into the rest of your team seeing that and then they are empowered to know how to present your story to other people. I think, you know, that's that's quite that's quite bold. I like yeah, that. I think from a publicity point of view, it definitely opens up many different angles, you know. There's lots of different avenues that you can go down. And I'm not saying at all, oh, I can only, you know, talk about the creative process, for example. Yeah. I'll talk about anything at all. I'll talk to you about my wallpaper if you want. I'll talk to you about my sex life. I'll talk to you about uh, if, if it's useful and if it's interesting and if I'm not hurting anybody else, you know, that's really, really important as well. And I do, of course, because I've written so openly about my family as well, I have conversations with them about mm -hmm. where things go and where things don't go. And um, And I think that, you know, I've written a lot about... I mean, I've, I have written a lot about my kids. I've written, but I think, and I could come in for criticism from that, but I think that anybody who read My World and Sleepless Nights, they would see that running through it all was a backbone, a sort of skeleton around it of absolute love for the children as well. And I've not said, I mean, my son got into the normal, all the normal kind of teenage, adolescent trouble, but it's not anything that is not anywhere else or he is you know he's not he's not hiding anything from it as well and also what he got up to is very very much what almost every adolescent boy gets up to as well and so for other adolescent or the mothers the parents of adolescent boys oh this is normal exactly yeah normal. yeah it's normal and and i think that then for those kids as well i really really hope that the book might have kind of help some of those kids because the parents would come down less hard on them and say you know it's part of life and we need to be talking about it and c communication is the key thing but it's not like something that needs to be you know you need to act react in a really really punitive way about um so yeah so the so the publicity is i think with memoir in a way it's very you know it's very liberating because because and I think that, um, you know, there's there's a lot of material, obviously, if you're writing your own story that you can go into. And because and also lots of magazines, newspapers such as that still exist, want real life stories as well. We want to hear about the real things that people have really, really gone through, probably more now than ever, maybe. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think you know, I, you've 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 some really important things there uh, and kind of clarified for me what what my what my question was which is that you you often feel when you're working on uh on a memoir that there's an element of asking permission to you know to work in a certain way um mm. and obviously having someone like you who is completely open and honest and is not not afraid to, you know, to talk about, uh, talk about everything that's happened. That's, you know, that set, that sets a tone. It's not always true. Of course, you know, for every right tomorrow, a lot of people are, are, you know, maybe not coming to it quite as openly. Uh, there is yeah. something that compels them to write, you know, to write this, but maybe it's, you know, they, they haven't been a journalist for as long as, as long as you have, and they're not as comfortable with that. And it's, you know, so there is always a level of conversation at the beginning. Yeah about about asking for permission and levels of you know of how comfortable people are you know yeah about what's happened to them yeah so sure. you also you kind of uh worked really nicely into my next question which is you know what what do you hope for you know when you're when you're sharing your story specifically in the medium of a, of a book right so is it the ability to really dive into the subject so it feels complete you know mm -hmm. whole 
Like what does, what does a book offer specifically that you, you know, that you think other mediums might not about communicating? I think that um, the sort of idea of a longevity that you can write a book and it might be something that people would read, you know, a long time afterwards and find something about themselves, about what they're going through and find a kind of some comfort in that is, you know, that for me is really, 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 really profoundly important. Communicating with other people and knowing that you have touched other people and that you have kind of um, made other people's path through this weird experience of being and difficult experience of being a, being a human being. Mm -hmm. uh, that feels like a huge, huge privilege as well to be able to do that. And so that's why, I mean, Instagram is the social media that I use the most and I've had such amazing conversations with people on there, you know, and and then have maybe met them in real life somewhere and knowing that that somehow what I have shared has changed their life in some way or another mm -hmm. is is an incredible, incredible feeling. And it might make their experience easier and it makes my experience easier as well. You know, I gain so, so much from that. Mm -hmm. um, and I, the whole world of being in a book, the, you know, this little thing that you can carry around, that you can inhabit an entire world, an entire universe, an entire kind of, you know, that whole, somebody's headspace. It's just, a, it's such an extraordinary, extraordinary thing. And, I think um, so. I think it's the communication with with other people. I mean, of course, you want your book to be like a big bestseller and to be recognised and made into a movie and all that kind of stuff. We can but dream for that kind of stuff, knowing that it has touched people really, really profoundly and made their stuff easier to bear. That's, I mean, that's the best. That's that's an incredible feeling. And from the beginning, did your team, did your agent, did your contacts, did they like from your first memoir you know did they get it did they kind of think that's exactly completely I know what you're trying to get across it was it was it hard to kind of pitch my um I I love the idea I feel like I do have a team now but it takes a while to get that and yeah. I have had different I've had I mean, actually, I had in the years before I ever wrote a book, when I was doing pure journalism, I had so many different agents would come on board, say you should write a book. I wrote two novels in my one in my twenties, one in my thirties. Went from one agent to another agent. Like they they didn't. I haven't. Those those books are not published. They they didn't sell. And um, and different agents saying, oh, you could do this and you could be this. And none of them helped me at all. Like it, none of not, it's very easy with an with an agent to think, oh, they are going to be the one who's going to like change my life, and that's going to be the thing that is going to make you know a massive, massive difference. Yeah. But I think it's like finding the personality, the type of personality that you want to be with. And for me, and then I move publishers between my first publisher and my second publisher, and I feel really, really, you know, very, very happy where I'm published now. I'm and I really feel. You know what for me was really important was a sense that I was, and I, I don't know why this is gendered, but like that I was talking to grown up women about this stuff because I was dealing with quite difficult stuff in my writing. I was dealing with, mm -hmm. you know, tr trauma, addictions, lots and lots of difficult things, and I felt like I needed I needed to be able to have th this kind of conversation that we're having now, and it's taken. A little bit of time but I feel like um, I feel like from a public you know how I'm published at the moment I'm really really I love I love the team there I love my editor I love um, the publicists they're all and, and they really feel as though they um, get me completely as a writer and they're not kind of because when you're writing very openly I think it's also you know it's kind of quite I think some people find it quite disturbing you know it can be even if they want to buy your book it still can be a bit disturbing and they don't want you to to go so far with you know with certain angles of the book let's say and and I but I feel like where I am now they really really 
get it and that feels really important and I've um I've got a new agent who is like she also specializes in lots of the digital stuff which is really exciting because lockdown you know really made me realize with as with so many of us that getting that digital stuff is really important and I don't have the expertise to I don't know how to like you know apart from doing interviews in my bedroom I don't know how to kind of make the digital stuff work I suppose so having an agent who specializes in that has been you know is, is really really fantastic as well um but I think you know so I think that in answer to your question I'm not sure I think that as a, if you're someone who is like hoping for a team to get behind you and like push you on you're lucky if you have that, you know, you're really, really lucky if you have that. It takes, it has to come from you. And yeah. especially I think in the early bit of the selling and the getting your, and, and you know, I, I have, as a journalist, I've, I've, I've been able to place certain articles, but I've, I'm also putting in a lot of legwork with social media. You know, it's, you have to work it all the time. It's not just gonna happen at all. Mm-hmm. And, you can have a book that's, you know, I've been lucky the books have sold quite well, both of them, but it doesn't, it's not as though yeah. you're suddenly yeah. making loads of cash and like it's all just flowing. It's you're, it's plugging away all the time. And I think that's why the relationship with the readers is so important. And that's why social media is such a wonderful gift because you can have those kind of like individual relationships in a way. And then your readers can trust you and you can you can kind of, you can communicate with each other, and that's a really that's a beautiful thing, actually. The, you know, the, 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 the common thread with so many authors that we've spoken to is that you have to be so committed and love what you do because that energy presents your work in a very specific way. You can't just expect to write a few words get lots of followers on social media and be cherry picked by an agent and go, Oh, you're the new fun thing. You know, I think you, you, there is so much legwork involved. There is so much, so there are so many connections that now, like you were saying, it's it, social media makes that so powerful, but it's not just the connections. It's the transparency that it mm-hmm. allows so that readers can connect to the people behind the stories you know? mm-hmm. and, and I think that that is quite powerful in itself but yes so much of it that you don't see so many people kind of see how things are presented on social media and kind of assume that there are these overnight successes and that it makes you know that's so easy and it takes so much time yeah so, and you have to yeah you have to really really want to do it and you don't make very much money from it you know you don't like it's not a massive uh, you know if you had a huge bestseller the idea of having a huge bestseller in it like going off that would be incredible but it's a hard it's kind of it's like a it's almost like a vocation really isn't it you have to really really want to do it if you're in it because you want like a nice book launch and a good dress to wear the parts of the party and to be (laughs) interviewed but in a newspaper or have loads of Instagram followers, then just forget about it. I mean, I think just forget about it because it's not about that at all. And actually, when I was younger, I did used to want that book launch with the dress and, you know, the cocktails and all that kind of stuff. And I do like doing the publicity and I do love, I love talking to people, you know, I love connecting with people. But the bit that has surprised me the most in a way is the bit that I like the most is the painful, frustrating, upsetting business of writing. That's what I really, really enjoy. And I I always thought, oh, you write the book and then you go to the parties and the parties are gonna be the really fun bit. But the (laughs) writing is the really, really fun bit. The creativity, like living with your creative energy around you, your book. My book, I mean, I'm really excited about this new book and I feel like, I feel like it's kind of like an amazing, dress that I'm just putting on and I'm just like learning to wear it and I can feel it kind of cut you know covering me in some way or another and I know that in the course of the next year that I'm going to get so much I'm going to get so much kind of nourishment creative nourishment from that feeling of living with this idea and the connections and the imagery and the reading that I can do about it and that is a really delicious feeling you know that's that's what excites me about it oh that's i mean it's what a, what a great description though it's it is it's like putting on 
a new thing that you have to figure out how to move and exist. Yeah, yeah. yeah definitely. Um, that's good. It's a really, it's the best, it's the best, best feeling of all. That's, that's, that's where the kind of magic is, definitely. And it is difficult, that thing of, you know, turning up at your desk and being in front of your computer and doing the work. And I have many, many, many days of trying to write and finding it really, really just horrendously difficult and feeling self-hatred and frustration and I can't do this and tears and then thinking that writing is actually sending me mad and why am I trying to do this and then push on through and somehow you know it becomes it becomes something and that's that's creativity uh, I guess that's creativity yeah I love I love that Every, everybody describes it like that it's really painful but at the end it's so worth it people are like why why <laughs> yourself Childbirth. yeah yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> um, so now we're, we're coming to the part where with the really really hard questions so now now that we've completely exhausted you <laughs> right so i'm going to ask you clover if you weren't doing what you're doing now okay mm -hmm. this pain and glory <laughs> um what would you do for work do you think i mean i think that i'd actually really like to do nursing i um I, you know the idea of doing something which really really connects with people to doing something which really gives back to other people in a kind of physical way um and an emotional way, I think that would be really incredible. I would love, I would actually love to be a midwife. If I wasn't a writer, I'd really love to be a midwife. So I think being present at the birth of children would just be mind blowingly amazing. I and mean, I know it's a really, really difficult job as well, but like the, I mean, I feel really envious of you about to give birth because it is a fucking awesome thing to go through. I mean, it's just so, crazy and amazing and difficult but so amazing and i think that would be a really that would be amazing amazing job to do yeah so in another life maybe maybe yeah. that's what i would do it's the beginning, it's the beginning. So touched by those people you know i remember so vividly we had I, for my son I had two midwives for two shifts each um and i will never forget them i will never yeah. ever forget them yeah it's yeah. the beginning it's the beginning of a new story isn't it I think that's, that's what's quite fascinating is that you're you are there at the very beginning of somebody's story and you don't know where that story is going to go. And it, the funny thing is, is that we did an interview with Claire Fuller and she said exactly the same thing. Oh, really? Really? Yeah. yeah. So um, interesting. You know, because I, I think, I think um, when, you're, when you're giving birth as well, you are really, really aware of – being between life and death, you know, being on the brink, definitely. Yeah. And um, I've never been present at a birth. I would really like, I mean, I, obviously I've been present at five births, but I've never been present at somebody else's birth. Yeah. And I would love, I would love that. But that feeling of, of you know, cr go, getting right to the edge of, of our existence, I mm -hmm. suppose, is fascinating, you know, it's fascinating and incredibly cosmic and just so exciting. And the thought as a midwife that you're doing that all the time and, yeah. and and helping women through this kind of massive, massive moment in their life is, yeah, it must be incredible. Yeah. Yes. Um, if there is something that you could share about yourself or your writing process, mm -hmm. right, that people might be surprised to know? <laughs> they basically if you've read my books you probably know pretty much everything about me anyway. <laughs> um what is surprising um uh i think that people are quite surprised by how long is spent in the thinking you know and and yeah. and and that that is as big a part of it as the actual writing. And I think that that can't really be stressed enough. And also in living, some friends of mine were staying recently. They were like in their late twenties. They really want to be writers. They really want to write. They're doing some writing. And I just felt, I remember that feeling as well. Like I must have a book published by the time I'm 30. I'm a complete yeah. failure. That's what I thought. I must, it's gotta be by the time I'm 30 or, and I just, and I said to them like, um, live your stuff go and experience, go and write, go and do stuff, go and talk to people. 
and write and communicate. And that is what you should be doing. And I think that sort of pressure to produce something amazing when you're younger is 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 wrong. I don't think that that's right. I think I think that the living and the thinking is really really critical to the writing. And I think that sometimes gets overlooked actually. That yeah. um, and particularly in memoir, you know, that's particularly in memoir. Yeah. And this is the hardest question so far. And every time we've asked people this, they just really struggle to find the answer. Mm. Desert Island book, you are only allowed one. Yeah, I know exactly what mine would be. <laughs> mine would be the um, the complete works of T.S. Eliot. Because <gasps> wow. in, in his, you know, for, I was once asked to write a piece for the Sunday Times for style section. There was a there was an article about different journalists and writers talking about their favourite self help books, and I <laughs> I don't think they published it because other people had done traditional self help books, and I said. Mine was The Wasteland wow. because that oh, poem, yes, wow. Poem that I just go back to again and again and again. I don't understand it. I don't understand all of it. I understand bits of it. Mm -hmm. You know, I get, I take bits from it. I read it to the kids, but I just think in T. S. Eliot there are whole worlds to be discovered mm -hmm. and rediscovered. So, on a desert island, it would definitely. I mean, I just you can't read him enough, and he and he teaches you so much about life and feeling and. He makes life so beautiful and so terrible, and um, he's just the most brilliant, brilliant writer ever to have lived. So yeah, that, that would be my that be my desert island book. That would really occupy much of your time. Yeah, <laughs> I love that answer. <laughs> uh, Colbert has been so lovely having you here with mm -hmm. us. You, this is this is really great. Thank you so yeah. much. It's like you've been so generous with kind of your writing and your experiences and your life in general. I mean, I think what a gift transparency is and to have somebody with that has lived through so much kind of share that, I think it's just, like I said before, I think it's really empowering for people to understand kind of how you do things and why. And you're really patient with your process. I think that's the one of the things that's so important. And I love, I love that you've kind of shared that. With so many I'm really, I'm really interested. I'm really interested. You say about the patience, actually. That's um because that thing of the sort of ferment fermentation of the idea is so is so critical. But um, it's been really, really lovely talking to you. I've really, really enjoyed it. Thank you very, very much Thank for you having me. And where can we just so because you're so active on social media, where can people find you just so they? If if you follow me on Twitter, it'll be a very disappointing experience. <laughs> You can if you want to, but I wouldn't really bother because I don't. I just don't really. I don't like Twitter. I always feel like I'm at a party where no, I'm just being completely ignored by everyone, and I don't oh, know. Oh, I, oh my goodness, that's so true. I said the other day, I was like, oh, I sometimes I just don't feel clever enough to kind of be part of the Twitter crowd. It's really, it's really difficult. I don't like it at all, and I also don't visually. I don't like the look of it. I don't like the whole format of it. I love Instagram and I post a lot on Instagram and I do lots of interviews with other writers, post about the children, post about writing, poetry, about family life, about gypsies, horses. Like I love it. I love, I really think that you can do something really creative with Instagram as well. Like the thing of a, an image and then a small amount of writing of whatever it is, 150, 200 words, you can create something really powerful there. And sometimes I'm just posting a, you know, a ridiculous picture of my son and his kilt or something, but, or it's something more profound, like, and, and I love the way it enables you to kind of like touch, touch different, you know, different areas of life, I suppose. So definitely Instagram is, um, is where it's at for me, definitely. Yeah. I also think, you know, uh, if, I think Instagram also is like writing practice. It's almost like yeah. just keeping that muscle trained constantly. Yeah. It doesn't matter, you know, and I, I I said this the other day and Marissa and I talked about it and I said like, I'm, I think engagement, I understand where people need the numbers for if they have a business or selling stuff, but I think creatively, you don't really, you don't have to worry about how many people are liking or not liking because it's practice. It's for you creatively to just keep yourself going. Yeah. I totally agree. And I've tested out idea like when I was writing the book about motherhood, My Wild and Sleepless Nights, and I was thinking, 
I want to write about this thing that's really dark and I don't know whether I should because I don't know whether other people are feeling, is it, is it, am I having some kind of breakdown or is this a normal feeling? And I would post something about it and people go, oh gosh, like, yes, I'm, you said what I was thinking. And I really like that way of, of like, yeah, creatively kind of trying ideas out a bit, yeah. definitely. Is um is interesting. It's interesting. Right. Okay. Great. So people can start kind of hounding you on Instagram then. Yeah. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you so much, Clover. It's been so great. It's been really, really lovely. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. That was so great. Goodness. I honestly, like, I could just keep talking. That yeah. was so great. It's like somebody. It's it's like having a cup of coffee with a friend that was such a lovely episode and i think i don't know it's i love the fact that you came at it kind of because you're coming at it from the industry side like you could see that you're kind of like twitching a bit yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I i've never had that difficult of a time no. frame. um yeah but it's i think it's because i'm, I'm feeling all of those conversations i've had in the in the in the past with people where you know you're you're approaching very delicate subjects, and oh, it's a different it's level. Isn't it? New, you don't know. Sometimes you haven't read the whole book at that point. They haven't written the whole book. Yeah, it, it's very difficult. Those first meetings with people can be very difficult to kind of get the lay of the land and understand and really find your footing in the relationship. Yeah. Oh no, I love it. It was so much fun. Right. Thank you all for joining us today on the Craft and Business of Books. Remember, we are on every Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern. So please click the link below to subscribe. It's been so great having you guys here. See you next week. <laughs>